we'll get it, we'll get it figured out. I want to talk this morning, and I want us to consider one of the messages of Christmas. We, we say all sorts of things. The Christmas message is this, the Christmas message is that. And as I was praying this week um, for, this, for this day and for this message, I felt that the Lord directed me to this passage. And so I want us to think this morning about one of the messages of Christmas. There are many messages of Christmas. And um, I want us to look at three passages very briefly, and then we'll talk about it. Look at the first one, and let's see if you, let's see, if you see the theme uh, that we're going to look at this morning. So in slide one, in Luke 28 through 31, uh, Gabriel appears to Mary. And what does he say? Uh, Greetings, favored woman. Now that sounds a little funny, doesn't it? Favored woman. That sounds so fancy. Um, Mary would have been most likely a young teenager, really a young teenager, perhaps 14 years old or, or something. The Bible doesn't tell us, but that, that is what we would expect. But according to their tradition, she was a woman at this age, so favored woman. And the Lord is with you. Now, if an angel appeared to you and said, <laughs> greetings, favored woman or favored man, um, the Lord is with you, how would you respond? Probably in the same way that Mary did, confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Um, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God, and you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus. So this is what <coughs> Gabriel says to, to Mary. But then there's another message, the next one, to Joseph, her fiancé, um, who is now considering divorce. And if you read the Bible story, you, you, some of us would say, why is he considering divorce? They're not married. But in the culture of that day, uh, uh, um, when you were engaged, that was pretty much the same as marriage. It was almost the same as marriage. And so it was serious enough that here's Joseph, he's going to, he was going to marry this young, good woman, he thought, and then he finds out she's pregnant. And so he's thinking about divorce, and he's going to divorce her, and the angel also appears to Joseph. And this is what, do, what does he say? He says, Joseph, descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she's conceived. She will have a son, you'll name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the New Testament, the Greek. In the Old Testament, what is the name? Joshua. That's the name. It's the, sa it's the same name. And so, do you see a theme already? We've read the same thing in both passages. And then there's one more passage. Think with me about the most famous passage out on the hills that night, under the night sky, when the angels appear in the sky. And what do they say to the shepherds? Look at the next one from Luke 2, 8 through 11. We read this this morning. The shepherds were in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. The angel of the Lord appears to them. The radiance of the Lord's glory surrounds them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will be, bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born to you today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Now, in every one of these announcements from the angels, we hear about Jesus has been born. But there's something else that is said every time in these three announcements. What else is said in each one of these passages? To Mary, to Joseph, and to the shepherds. What is it? There's one, there, there is, do not be, it's, it's, there you go, Ying, and I heard a few others. Do not be afraid, or don't be afraid. If you have a King James, we would say, fear not. When I was growing up, our family on Christmas Eve, we'd turn the lights down low, we'd sit around the Christmas tree, and we would read the Christmas story. And of course, in our family, especially in those days, it was always the King James, not a modern translation. And I still remember the Christmas story in the King James, the, those, those few verses. Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Um, so if you're in the King James, we would, we would say, fear not. In other modern translations, it's do not be afraid. And so I want us to talk, next slide, this morning. One of the messages of Christmas is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, some of us might say, hmm, 
That doesn't sound like a Christmas message. Trust me, it is. And we've just read it in three passages. Do not be afraid. Fear not. And so I want us to look very quickly this morning at three things related to the Christmas story that can help us not to be afraid. Now, we're all grown-ups here this morning, so we have our grown-up faces on, and none of us would be likely to admit to other people, sometimes I'm afraid, sometimes I'm really worried, or if we are, we keep it in our hearts. When I was a child, from the age of eight onward, I grew up in Singapore, but from the age of eight onward, I grew up in South Alabama in the United States. And our family lived way out in the woods. No other houses were around us. And uh, there was a big lake in front of our house. And because of where I lived in the woods and the water, there were a lot of snakes where I lived. Really, a lot of snakes, both non-poisonous and poisonous, and really plenty of poisonous snakes. There were water moccasins, copperheads, these are types of poisonous snakes, cottonmouth, that's another type of moccasin, deadly, it, it will kill you, rattlesnakes of various sorts. There were snakes all over the place. Probably every week, in the, at, not in the winter time, but in warmer weather, probably every week we saw two or three snakes. Sometimes poisonous, sometimes not. I was not afraid of snakes. I'd, I'd pick up a stick and I'd kill them. Um, from eight onwards, I had learned how to do it. You know, I'd watched, I'd watched my father. I wasn't afraid of snakes. But turn out the lights at night in our bedroom with my sister, and I was terrified of the monsters under my bed. <laughs> were you? Don't tell anybody. We, most of us were. I knew there were monsters under the bed. I knew that their arms were long and it could reach up over the sides. And if my hands were sticking out, and if any part of my body was sticking out, the monsters would grab them and pull me under and that would be it. And if I had to get up in the night to go to the restroom, I would jump from my bed far out into the room so that monsters couldn't grab my feet as I went. And then I would jump back in again. Now you all are laughing. That's totally unrational. How could I be not afraid at all of snakes and terrified of monsters which are not, not real under my bed? But you know, I never, even as a very small child, I never told anybody, I didn't even tell my sister that I was afraid of monsters under my bed. I didn't want to tell anybody. We don't like admitting we're afraid, do we? We don't, like to, we don't like to let people know. It seems unreasonable. It seems foolish. It seems childish, perhaps. But do you know what I have found? I have found that whatever our age, people struggle with fear at times. And usually, we don't tell others about it. Right? Sometimes we don't even tell our closest friend or our husbands or our wives. Sometimes we're afraid I'll be alone all my life. Sometimes we're afraid I can't take care of my family. Sometimes we're afraid I don't know if I'm going to find a job or not. Sometimes we're afraid, what if something happens to my health? We're afraid, sometimes if you're a younger person, you may be afraid of how you do in school or how you don't do in school. Parents, sometimes you're afraid, I can't get my kid into the school I want them to be in. There are all sorts of things that bring fear, that try to bring fear to our hearts. And what I have seen, and all we have to do is look at the news, is to realize you and I, we live in a world filled with fear. We really do. We live in a world filled with fear. But brothers and sisters this morning, though our world is filled with fear, fear does not have to fill our hearts. Fear does not have to fill our hearts. And I want us to look this morning at just three things very, very Got to, let me take my watch off. We've got, to, we've got to keep our time close today. Because the message of Christmas is, one of the messages of Christmas is, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. A Savior has been born to you. So let's look at three things 
Now I'm going to step outside of the Christmas story for just a minute, and I want you to consider with me all the way back in the Old Testament. Moses and the children of Israel were at the edge of the promised land. They were getting ready to cross in, and then Moses found out, and Joshua found out, and all of Israel found out. The only leader you've ever known, Moses, cannot go with you into the promised land. He's not with you anymore. You're going to have a new guy, Joshua, a young guy, a much, much younger, but still pretty old. But Joshua had not been their leader, and everything was going to change. I want you to look with me at the words that Moses gives that come from God. It's in Deuteronomy 31.6. He says, the encouragement is, and it comes from God, be strong and brave. Don't be afraid of them because they're going into an unknown situation. And don't be frightened. Do not be afraid. Why? Because the Lord your God will go with you. He will not leave you or forget you. Those are words they needed to hear. And brothers and sisters, this morning, these are words that you and I need to hear as well. God will not forget you. He will not leave you. He will go with you. He is with you. I talk with people sometimes who feel so alone. I'm on my own. Maybe something has happened to them. Maybe a loved one has died. Maybe a life partner has died. Or there have been huge changes in their lives or relationships are broken and they feel so isolated and they feel so alone. And fear can grip our hearts when that happens. I say to you this morning the message of Christmas. Do not be afraid. God is with you. God is with you. Remember what we just sang and what we heard the children sing? Look at Isaiah 7:14. This is one of the this is one of the, the verses that we know so well. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. She will give birth to a son and will call him what? Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. Brothers and sisters, that is not just a nice religious saying this morning. That's not just a nice warm, fuzzy feeling. Oh, Emmanuel, and I can sing about that. This is what God says to you and to me. God with us. He will be this, and he is this. And so this morning, if this is one of the fears that you deal with, you feel alone, you feel I'm on my own, I don't have anybody else to depend on, I have to kao zi, as we say in China. I have to depend on myself. What you need to know is this, and what you need to hold on to is this. The next slide. Don't be afraid. God is with you. Don't be afraid. God is with you. In every situation, in the tightest tight spot, in the darkest valley, in the deepest night. God is with you. Don't be afraid. When you're holding on to a problem that is huge and you think, I have to solve this and I don't know how, don't be afraid. God is with you. God is with you. Amen. Amen. Let's look at another one. Consider with me the characters of the Christmas story. We have Mary, a young woman who, honestly, brothers and sisters, does not seem to be very remarkable. There was really nothing that set her apart from many other young women in Palestine at that time. She was a good young woman and a virtuous young woman, um, but she wasn't from a, a wealthy family. She was not a, from a, in a prominent city, um, Nazareth, where they were. That was kind of a, as we would say in, in the U.S., that was a backwater. That's what that's called. It's a backwater. It's a nothing town. It's, a, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody wanted to be from Nazareth. And that's where Mary was from. We don't read anything about her parents at all. No, nothing about this. And so here's this Mary. Well, what about Joseph? Here's one of the other characters, the earthly father of Jesus. We don't know a lot about him either, except that he was 
living in Nazareth. His ancestors were from Bethlehem, but he also was not from a big fancy city. They were descendants of David, of King David, both of them. But you know what, brothers and sisters? I don't know if you've thought about it before. Do you know in Jerusalem there were many other descendants of David at that time? Many descendants of David, not just Joseph and not just Mary. And so there's nothing particularly remarkable about them. If you read a little bit further in the Bible, do you know what else you will see? You will see that um, after 40 days when they go to the temple for Mary to give the offering for the purification, according to Jewish law, the offering that they gave was not a lamb. They gave two pigeons. Do you know what that means? Although the Bible doesn't tell us directly. That means they were kind of poor. In fact, they may have been very poor. So they weren't from a prominent, Joseph wasn't from a prominent family. He didn't have a lot of wealth or riches. In fact, he would have been on the lower end of things. So there's nothing very remarkable about these two, except that when the angel spoke to them, both of them were obedient to the message of the Lord and to what the Lord was saying to them. Both of them immediately said, Yes, Lord. So they were obedient. But other than that, nothing particularly remarkable. How about the shepherds on the first night? What were some of the names of the shepherds? We've got Joseph, we've got Mary, later on Anna, Simeon. What were some of the names of the shepherds? Any names? No names. Here we are, central cast of characters. We don't know a single name. What we do know is this. Shepherding was a pretty low occupation in Palestine. The youngest sons did that. So Daniel, that would have been your work if in, in your family. Daniel would have been a shepherd. Uh, Mark would have been a, a shepherd, but uh, not, not Francis. He's a little too young for that. But the, the youngest ones would have been shepherds. Johnny, you would have been a shepherd. And guess what? you would have been stinky and smelly because the sheep were stinky and smelly. Or if you were very, very old and you couldn't do, and you couldn't do skilled labor anymore, then also you might be one of the shepherds. So here they are, low class in society, and yet um, they're part of the Christmas story. Now how does this relate to you and to me this morning? I think this, is, this relates to us because we look at our lives sometimes, and I'm speaking to every one of us here this morning, and we look at our lives compared to other people's lives in this world. Is your life remarkable? Are you extremely wealthy or powerful? Are you outstanding in some way? Everybody notices you? Or would you say, pretty much, my life is kind of boring? My life is not particularly remarkable in any way. I don't stand out in, in, in any way. I don't really matter very much. What I do perhaps doesn't make a difference in this world. My life, it's kind of like Joseph's. It's kind of like Mary's. It's kind of like the shepherd's. Nothing particularly remarkable. I believe the first Christmas tells us otherwise. A young woman, a poor man, smelly, low-class shepherds out in the hills with sheep and a baby. These were the characters on that Christmas night. And their lives mattered because they were part of God's plan. Brothers and sisters, this morning, your life matters because you are part of God's plan. And you say, I haven't done anything great. I'm old now, and what have I done with my life? I've tried so hard, but I haven't made a been able to do the things that I've dreamed of. I haven't had the advancements in work that I wanted to have. I'm not very important. You count, and your life matters to God because He values you and because you are part of God's plan. One day... Jesus was teaching the crowds, and he's talking with them about not worrying in this world. And then he gave an example that was so vivid, and it's in Luke 12, 6 through 7. Look at what Jesus says. What is the price of five sparrows? Okay, how many of you would buy a sparrow, by the way? No, not unless you're in China, where you eat them on a stick. 
okay? Y you, do, you do in China. Um, what is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head, they're all numbered, so don't be afraid. Ah, here we have this passage again. Don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Now some of you, I see the men, some of you are laughing and you're thinking about your hair right now. So we're going to talk about you. I, I saw two guys, two men back there already thinking about it. We're going to get to you in just a minute. Actually three men and they're all sitting together. You know who I'm talking about right back there. <laughs> and we're laughing about that. But brothers and sisters, really, this is part of it. Are any of you bird watchers? I told you this was going to be a simple Christmas message this morning. Me, I am a very amateur bird watcher. I have binoculars and a bird book. And in America, I do the same thing. And I, I look at various birds. But let me tell you what birds I totally ignore. I ignore sparrows. In fact, it took me years to find out there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of varieties of sparrows. Did you know that? I didn't either. We all thought that sparrows were just all the same, didn't we? Because we don't pay any attention to them. They're brown. They're boring. They're everywhere. They're not spectacular. They're not. And it's interesting to me that Jesus, to make his point, chose sparrows. He could have chosen other birds, couldn't he? He chose sparrows because nobody pays attention to them. And he says, what's the price of five sparrows? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And so if he doesn't forget about sparrows, you think he's going to forget about you? Your life matters. Your life matters matters to God. Your don't be afraid. Your life is of value. Your life is of worth. That's, God does not measure your life the way that the world measures. And then think about our hairs. Just a minute. Have you tried counting your hairs lately? Some of you would have an easier time than some of us. <laughs> Whenever I go to get my hair cut, my hairdresser, do you know what he almost always says? He'll be cutting my hair and he'll say, Jennifer, you have so much hair, and I do. I have a lot of hair, and it grows fast. Um, and I'm happy for that. Uh, but I've never tried counting my hairs. Have you ever tried counting your hairs? No, we haven't. So if I were to say to you, I should have looked it up. I should have Googled it. How many hairs are on the average head? I'm guessing, have you, has anybody ever Googled that before? But I'm guessing maybe in the millions. Wouldn't you think so? Yes. Maybe? I don't, uh, you're, don't Google it now. We'll Google it later. Okay? <laughs> don't Google it now. But the point is this, brothers and sisters, and, and I'm not trying to make light in a sermon, but this is the example that Jesus gave. Look very carefully at what he says. Jesus did not just say, he didn't say, I know how many hairs are on your head. Do you know what he said? He said, more incredible and unbelievable than that, he said, every hair is numbered. That means God not just knows how many hairs are on your head, he knows each one of them has a number. Each one has a number. There's this one, this one, and this one. God knows that. And you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're making too much. I'm not. This is what Jesus said. And the point that Jesus is making is you matter to God. So don't be afraid. Here it comes again. Don't be afraid. You're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows and even much more valuable than that. Next slide. Do not be afraid. Your life matters. It does not depend on your bank account. It does not depend on how many children you have. It does not depend on your grades at school. It does not depend on your promotion at work. It does not depend on how smart you are. It depends on God's care and love for you. You are part of his plan, and your life matters. And then finally this morning, let's look at one, one other thing. And I want to talk about your heart, and I want to talk about peace. This is the last one very, very quickly this morning. When is your heart at peace? So the first one, let me just by way of reminder, do not be afraid. God is with you. Do not be afraid. Your life matters. Your life matters. And then finally, I want to ask about your heart. When is your heart at peace? When everything is going okay? Yes. When your health is good? Yes. When your bank account is healthy? Yes. 
when you're able to do everything you need to do in school, when you have found just the right apartment and the landlord does not raise the rent unreasonably, especially true in Hong Kong, when all of your relationships are okay, when you get your kids in the school you want them to be in, we know that some of you are trying to get your kids in school right now, and then everything is peaceful. You've got your plan worked out, you've got your life worked out, you know how things are going to work out. But think with me for just a minute about that first Christmas. Imagine Joseph and Mary, the young couple in love, really, as we would say in the U.S., holding hands, making plans. That's what, that's what we would say, holding hands, making plans. Joseph loved Mary. Mary loved Joseph. They had planned a life together. It was going to be a good life. They had it all worked out. And then something happens to interrupt that. Jo Mary is told, you're going to be with child. Or you're, you're going to, you're favored. And she thinks, hey, great. And then she finds out, but you're going to be pregnant before you're married. Not great. In a small town, everybody would talk. Really, everybody would talk. Everybody would gossip. Everybody would point fingers and blame. What about Joseph? He had chosen this young woman. He loved her. And she was virtuous, a good young, wo young woman. And then he finds out she's pregnant. How did he find out? We don't know. Did Mary tell him or did the rumors start already? Imagine his confusion and imagine the peace that, that scattered in his hearts. This young woman that he had trusted, that he'd given his heart to, that he was going to make a life with to find out she's going to have a baby and it's not mine. I, and and I, I'm not trying to make light of the Christmas story, but this is really true, brothers and sisters. That was part of the story. And so his plans are, are, are broken. His life is crushed. There was love for one another. Imagine that. Imagine that, brothers and sisters, if that were your story this morning. Your story this morning. All peace disrupted. And it was into that situation that the angel said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Look with me at Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. What do we see here? Next slide. Uh, go, slide 12, please. Slide 12. For to us is born a child, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and what? Prince of, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And then in Luke 2, 10 through 14, what did the angels say? Don't be afraid. What did the angels say? Peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. And now look with me this morning as we come to a close at what Jesus said to his disciples in a time of great turmoil, as you and I face sometimes. Slide 13. Do not be afraid. God gives us his peace. He comes as the Prince of Peace, and he brings peace into our hearts and to our lives. John 14, 27 and 28. Jesus says, in the midst of a storm, I am leaving you with a gift. Oh, Christmas is all about gifts. Here's a gift for you and for me this morning. Peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Do you need peace this morning? The Prince of Peace has come. It is his gift to you. Next slide. Do not be afraid. God gives you his peace. I don't know what you're going to face tomorrow. I don't know what 2017 is going to bring. But let me tell you what I do know. You know what I do know? You are going to face a storm sometime in 2017. Your plans are going to get messed up sometime in 2017. The things you had arranged, they're not going to work out sometime in 2017. But the God of peace is with you. So when it happens, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God is with you. Your life matters. 
and God gives you his peace. Shall we close in prayer this morning? Shall we stand together?